Thank you, everyone. Very uh, happy to be here to talk about our research, and I will be co-presenting this research with Eric Everton, who's a PharmD candidate from the Medical College of Wisconsin uh, for 2020. Uh, so our objectives today are to demonstrate the prevalence of awareness of loperamide abuse and the current state of ability to restrict its sale throughout the United States at retail pharmacies. We have no conflicts of interest to disclose in regards to this presentation. I have been told that if you want to communicate a message, you should tell a story. So I'd like to tell a brief story about why we're doing this project in the first place. Hello, today I'm going to be doing some field research to see if there are any barriers to purchasing as many boxes of loperamide as I possibly can in a retail setting. Let's go. Our story actually begins in 1977 when a pharmaceutical firm in Belgium took a molecule that was structurally related to methadone and haloperidol and marketed it as a Schedule V prescription drug in the United States called loperamide. In 1980, Yaffe et al. took loperamide and compared it to 120 milligrams of codeine. And in ex-opioid users, they found that loperamide's effects were liked less often than codeine and it had low abuse potential. In fact, a few months prior to that study, the drug company had already requested full decontrol uh, based on the fact that over two years of sold doses, there had been no deaths reported. The FDA advisory panel agreed with this recommendation, and full decontrol happened in 1982. And now, in the midst of an opioid epidemic, you can walk through pharmacies and grocery stores and see thousands of milligrams of mu agonists sitting on the shelf. I am not the only one who has noticed this. Take the example of the user of a popular internet forum who we'll call Snorlax. They say, why isn't there more out there about this stuff? This is a legit opiate, and it's just on the shelves. Even going on to happily proclaim that they don't get any adverse heart reactions from doses of 200 to 288 milligrams and days-long warm, fuzzy feelings. But Snorlax's story takes a dark turn. A few days later, stating, I wound up in the ICU because of this stuff. And you don't have to look far to find other sad stories, such as grieving loved ones who lost family members that were using loperamide to prevent opioid withdrawal, or the cries of those in the throes of loperamide addiction itself. We've seen an increase in intentional ingestion and healthcare facility treatment of loperamide reported to the National Poison Data System in the last five years. We've also seen an increase in moderate and major effects, as well as deaths reported every year. Over 50% of loperamide case reports related to overdose were published after the year 2014. And the most common reason for overdose in these case reports was users seeking an opioid alternative. As the medical community began encountering this cardiotoxin with a reward pathway, the news media picked up on it and eventually the FDA said that they wanted to help curb the abuse of Imodium, the poor man's methadone. So on January 30th of 2018, the FDA stated that they would reduce the package size that loperamide could be sold in. And just six days ago, on September 20th, uh, they stated that the maximum package size will be 48 milligrams. But, as our keynote speaker said, an addict can find a beer in the desert. And in a world where substance use finds a way, and I can purchase 25 boxes of loperamide without any restriction, it does call into question whether this will be an effective intervention to curb abuse of loperamide. So what can pharmacists do to prevent harm? These are healthcare workers working in a setting where they may be selling a harmful substance. Are retail pharmacists aware loperamide is being abused? And are any currently regulating its sale to reduce harm? So that brings us to our study goals. We wanted to characterize retail pharmacists' knowledge of loperamide abuse at the point of access and characterize the ability of retail pharmacists to restrict its sale throughout the U.S. I'd like to welcome up Eric Everton to discuss our methods and results. Thank you, Dr. Feldman. To select our sample, we collected a list of all U.S. zip codes 
and use a random number generator to identify three zip codes from each state that we would contact. Once we had these zip codes, we used a Google Maps nearby function to generate a list of pharmacies from within the zip codes that we could contact. Once we had these lists, we used another random number generator to identify which pharmacy from within this list that we would contact. We continued contacting pharmacies until three from each state and three from the District of Columbia took the survey. So in total, 153 pharmacies participated. The breakdown of different pharmacies that were contacted included 93 chain, 58 independent, and two hospital affiliated pharmacies. The survey itself, consisted of a trained interviewer giving a script of three question yes or no surveys to the assumed pharmacist. The first question asked if they were aware of loperamide abuse. The second question asked if they were aware of how loperamide was abused through large doses or PGP inhibitor co-ingestion. And the final question asked if they suspected abuse, were they able to restrict the quantity or deny the sale? The results showed that around 75% of pharmacists were aware of loperamide abuse. This number may be even lower due to the response bias in our questions where if they answered no, it would have implied a knowledge deficit. The second question showed that around 25% of pharmacists were aware of how loperamide was abused. Again, this number may be even lower due to the response bias. And finally, around 31% of pharmacies felt that they were able to restrict the sale. The breakdown between chain pharmacies and independent and hospital pharmacies showed very little difference, except for the last question, where more pharmacies in the independent and hospital pharmacy group felt that they were able to restrict the sale when compared with chain pharmacies. The free text responses were categorized into eight themes. The first four showed ways that they could restrict loperamide sale. 29 pharmacies just felt that they could deny the sale outrightly. 12 pharmacies did not stock an abusable quantity. Two pharmacies had a quantity restriction or a log of purchase, and three pharmacies voluntarily placed loperamide behind the counter. The second set showed ways that they had issues of restriction. 72 pharmacies just felt they had no way of restricting a sale. 20 pharmacies could not uh, monitor purchasing at other places within the store. Nine pharmacies had concerns regarding denying over-the-counter sales. And six pharmacies wanted a policy or a management-mandated sales restriction. In summary, around 25% of pharmacists were not aware of loperamide abuse, and 75% of pharmacists were not aware of how loperamide was abused. Again, these numbers may be even higher due to the response bias of our questions. Pharmacists' perceived barriers to regulating the sale included OTC status ambiguity, management decisions, and being purchased at other parts of the store. Only 3% of pharmacists kept loperamide behind the counter or monitored the sale. Individual pharmacies may replace loperamide behind the counter require a log of purchase, reduce the purchasable quantity, or reduce the over-the-counter stock. No state has a regulation in place to restrict the sale, and no store policy can reduce collateral purchasing at places such as the Dollar Tree or Amazon. The FDA's efforts to reduce loperamide abuse via package size limitations may be unsuccessful without increasing pharmacists' ability to monitor the sale. Some limitations to our study included the response bias of our questions, where the response to the question implies a knowledge deficit, if the answer was no, and then our sample size because of undercoverage of pharmacies that may have not been in our Google search. We'd like to acknowledge and thank Cameron Cole for the work that he did as a part of this study. Is there any questions? Hi, I'm David Wood from London. A very interesting study. You mentioned quite a lot about response bias, and you thought that people were basically saying yes, so they didn't want to say to acknowledge a knowledge deficit. Did you think about including some questions which clearly um, were where there was no abuse potential or something, so that you had to sort of start screen a question, see if people were just answering it uh, as you thought they might be? That is a wonderful idea. We did not include it in part. Uh, well, we did not think to do it. That would, would have been very nice. But, um, you know, a lot of the, the limitations and the questions that we had to ask were based on the fact that we are cold calling a pharmacy to speak to the pharmacist of record that we assume is the pharmacist. And they're very busy and don't like to be on the phone long. So we had to try to keep it as short as we could. But that would have been a nice comparator and maybe for future. Burkhardt, FDA. I'm curious, if, uh, Surveyor, how much you know uh, the pharmacy um, the societies are as far as uh, CME training. 
and uh, this seems like a great opportunity to, to get out there and educate uh, for the you know, mandatory CME that's required by pharmacists. In terms of available CME that's out there already, I'm not sure specifically uh, if this has been an initiative for anyone such as um, APHA or, or anything, but some place, you know, the drug company itself, Johnson & Johnson, has been doing outreach to, you know, healthcare professionals. Uh, they told me they're working with some addiction groups where people are learning how to abuse loperamide from each other and trying to stem that, but I don't know how much outreach they're doing to specifically pharmacies, but it is a good opportunity, I would say, based on these results. Thank you.